All right, folks. So today I want to look at a paper that makes the case for the reduced instruction set computer. This was published back in 1980 by Patterson and Ditzel. And Patterson, along with John Hennessy, went on to win the 2018 Turing Award in Computer Science for their work on reduced instruction set architectures and the impact that has had on computing in general. We know for a fact that the vast majority of computer chips in existence today are RISC chips. We have the x86 instruction set, which is considered a complex instruction set or a CISC chip in servers and on desktop, but the numbers of that chip are completely dwarfed by the massive amounts of mobile devices that have ARM based chips, which have a reduced instruction set architecture. To start off their argument, the authors want to look at the cost effectiveness of the entire computer system. This includes not just the hardware, but also the software, the compilers, the languages, everything that goes into implementing an entire computer system. They look at the then current trend towards ever more complex instruction sets and wonder if that actually has a positive effect on the total cost effectiveness of those computer systems. They cite the VAX 11 as an example of a very complex instruction set and we can take a look at some of the instructions that were actually in there. Just to give you an example of the type of complexity that the authors are talking about here, this is the reference manual for the VAX 11 instruction set. And it has built-in instructions to manage queues. These are doubly linked list queues, which are a pretty high level data structure and something you would think would be implemented in a high level language. But here we have native hardware support for it. Here is another highly complex instruction. It evaluates a polynomial. So there is a table which points to polynomial coefficients. And this one instruction evaluates the entire polynomial. This is a built-in instruction in the hardware. We have a number of string manipulation instructions, like locating a character in a string. We even have an instruction that calculates a cyclic redundancy check. So this should give you some idea of the kind of instruction set complexity that the authors are trying to argue against in this paper. The overall structure of this paper is to first examine why complexity in instruction sets has increased over time, what are the forces driving that, and then look at how a reduced instruction set can address some of those issues. One of the things that drove complexity was the difference between main memory and CPU. Now at the time, CPU was about 10 times faster than main memory. This meant that if you had primitive instructions that could encode a lot of complexity, you would only have to fetch one instruction from main memory into your CPU, and you could then get a lot of work done. Otherwise, if you went and fetched a large number of instructions from main memory into CPU, you would spend a lot of time just waiting for memory. This is what first led floating point subroutines to get subsumed into the hardware instruction set. Another big driver for complexity in instruction sets was microprogramming. Since microprograms are essentially just like tiny little programs inside the chip, this made it very easy to add more and more complex instructions that were then implemented in terms of microprograms. This was essentially the same as taking some very common subroutines and moving them into the architecture. Like we just saw from the VAX instruction set, things like string editing or polynomial evaluation, which one would think are really high level complicated things, were getting moved into the instruction set itself. In these early computers, memory was very expensive, and thus it paid to have 
very small and compact programs. The authors point out, though, that if you try to increase code density by having more and more complex instructions and addressing modes, those require more bits to represent them. So there is a trade-off. You might be giving away some of the code density you're getting by making your instruction set more complex. And this is not a technical reason, but complex computers were easier to sell. The complexity was presented as being better, and the customers were not technical enough to evaluate the trade-offs between complexity and the overall cost effectiveness of the complete system. Related to that was the issue of upward compatibility, which means that new chips never ever removed instructions or, in, or addressing modes. They almost always only added newer and more complex features. There was market pressure to include all the instructions that their competitors had come up with as well. Ironically, support for high-level languages was used as an argument to build more complex instruction sets. The idea was that these higher level instructions would reduce the semantic gap between the high level language and the hardware. I say ironically because later we'll see that it is much easier to support high level languages with a reduced instruction set computer. Programming in high level languages was one of the crucial things that led to the rise of reduced instruction set computers. And why is that? One would think that reducing the semantic gap between the language and the hardware would be helpful for compilers, but that is not true. It is actually harder for compilers to use these complex instructions, and the reason is their specificity. It is very difficult for a compiler to map a very, very specific complex instruction in the hardware to a sequence of high-level code. Compilers tend to be more regular, and so they try to avoid all the tricks that one would use when manually programming in assembly language. What this results in is only a small fraction of the entire instruction set being used. What the authors found was that for an IBM 360 compiler, only 10 instructions accounted for 80% of all instructions executed. And this goes on to 16 instructions covered 90%, 21 for 95%, and 30 for 99%. So this should give you an idea of how tiny of a fraction of the entire instruction set compilers are actually able to productively use. The authors also found that special purpose complex instructions are not even always faster compared to implementing the same functionality with simpler instructions. A concrete example of that is the index instruction from the VAX computer. This instruction finds an element within an array while also doing bounds checking to make sure the indexes within the bounds of the array. However, implementing the same instruction in terms of simpler instructions, that is, you would have a loop that looks at each byte and so on, was actually 45% faster. And if you looked at the special case where the lower bound was zero, the simple instruction sequence was 60% faster. It also takes much longer to design and implement CISC computers, and they tend to have many more errors. Ultimately, what we want from our hardware is performance. And the authors argue that a simpler instruction set results in faster performance just by virtue of its simplicity. A RISC machine needs less microcode, it needs fewer gates, and all this can lead to a faster cycle time for the chip. For example, if simplifications to the instruction set speed it up by 10%, that means that any addition would only be worth it if that addition sped up the machine by more than 10%. 
Risk computers also make better use of area on the chip. The space that you save by eliminating instruction set complexity can be used for caches, it can be used for faster transistors, or even deeper pipelines. And all these things will have a positive impact on the overall performance of the hardware. As they alluded to earlier in the paper, the authors argue that it is easier to write compilers when the instruction set is simple and uniform. It is almost always pretty hard to actually take advantage of the complex instructions that perform very high level operations. And that's because these functions are so specialized that they are hard to use in a general setting. They can usually be replaced by the same functionality implemented with simpler instructions without any loss in performance. Another example of this is pushing a register on the stack, and there's a high-level instruction which does that, but it's slower than the move instruction which does the same thing. So to conclude, the authors note that once again, they are making an argument from the total system point of view. Even though one could nitpick with the arguments that they have presented here by coming up with examples of unique high-level instructions that greatly speed up certain programs, the authors here argue that those benefits will not translate to the system as a whole. One can think of this entire argument as a special case of the general end-to-end -end principle that I have covered in another video. And before I end, I want to mention that there's one huge reason that the authors missed over here in favor of risk computers, and that is energy. This paper was written back in 1980 before mobile devices were a huge deal. But obviously, energy consumption is a big factor in the choice of architecture for mobile devices. And that's the reason why you see ARM chips dominate in the mobile space. And adding credence to the arguments presented in this paper, we are now beginning to see ARM chips getting used on the server. We are seeing a risk computer scaling up, but at the same time, we've seen that Intel has had a very difficult time trying to bring the x86 architecture to mobile devices. So that was the paper that initially made the case for reduced instruction set computers. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.